General Officer Commanding 15 Corps, IC General uh, KJS Dillon here, DGDIA and former GOC 15 Corps, Delegate Speakers to the Seminar, General Officers Commanding, General Officers Honoured Guests, Officers of the Chinar Corps, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning. My compliments to the GOC and the Chinar Corps for putting this seminar together because amidst all the action and delivery that 15 Corps is known for, it is always a good idea to periodically pause and introspect and if necessary, course correct. In fact, in critical, complex and sensitive matters like Kashmir, clear-headed ideation may be of overwhelming importance. I am delighted, therefore, to be delivering the keynote address today. Thank you, General Pandey and the Chinar Corps, both for the opportunity and the invite. Now, the purport of this seminar has been laid out uh, quite clearly and concisely by the GOC, which is, of course, to discuss HR violations by terrorists. And the concept note outlines the issues very clearly, subjugation of the Kashmiri ecosystem by the terrorist OGW separatist nexus, the or orchestrated mechanism of protests to control the levers of the daily lives of the Kashmiri people, citizenry, resulting in denial of livelihood, the very ordinary right to attend schools and colleges, the ability to lead normal lives, the consequential deleterious impact on the economy, and even the systematic subversion of women empowerment. All these issues are extremely pertinent and will of course be debated, discussed today threadbare by seasoned hands and minds, well versed with and rooted deeply in the realities of Kashmir. I have myself seen these dynamics metrics operate unfold very closely in my last tenure here as the GOC at Baramula. So they are very important issues. But may I suggest and that will be the theme of my keynote, that the paradigm in JNK is far more intricate and complex. So while leaving you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, over the next two days to discuss issues that you have laid out for yourselves or that 15 core has laid out for you, allow me to make a few points from the larger standpoint of statecraft, the strategic military frame, if you will, issues which, in my view, are germane to and linked intricately with the future of, with, of Kashmir, with peace and prosperity in Kashmir. These issues, may I also proffer, have a certain aura of constancy about them. They assert themselves with near periodic regularity, yet we tend to ignore them sometimes, often at our own peril. So what are these issues? Well, in my view, they are five in number, and I'll outline them for your very kind consideration. The first point is that Kashmir's destiny is always, has always been and will remain transfixed in a certain geostrategic frame, which we cannot disregard. These geostrategic motivations demand or mandate that the response of the Indian state is of course thoughtful and wise, but always strong and robust. That's the first point about Kashmir's destiny being linked to a certain geostrategic frame which we cannot disregard. The second point that I would like to make to you is that the ties of Kashmir with the rest of India are not merely geographic or geostrategic. They are deeply organic. There is a civilizational continuity about them that go back what some historians say, 5,000 years, 5,094 to be precise. They are intricately cultural. They are deeply historic, as I said, very intrinsic, so deep and organic that they are not open to dilutions of any form. The third point, and it is in the context of the second point, therefore the salience of the neutering of Article 370 on the 5th of August 2019. Why is it so significant? I shall make just a few points in my view why it was so, such a significant step. The fourth point 
is about human rights. General Pandey alluded to the human rights of all those uh, unfortunate victims over the last month. We have seen street vendors, carpenters, school teachers, absolute innocents being uh, who have uh, massacred uh, quite brutally. So the point that I would like to make is that human rights in Kashmir must be a universal virtue to be applied in fair and equal measure across communities, across sects, across traitors of society. Else the wounds in Kashmir may be very difficult to heal. And finally, and this is a point that I make with about some experience in the valley, the great importance, relevance and utility of the instrument of force in Kashmir. Not as a blunt in your face tool, but as a sophisticated, calibrated, sharp instrument that operates in sync with other elements of Indian statecraft. Let me now dilate very briefly on each of these issues over the next 20-25 minutes that have been allotted to me. The first point is about geostrategics. In my view, Jammu and Kashmir is central to India's geostrategic equipoise, its strategic balance. Events in Jammu and Kashmir along our northern borders, the LAC or the LC have the potential of upsetting our strategic balance. Therefore, all the movements that we carry out, rebalancing, so on and so forth, even as we do them, even as we respond to local challenges, we must not take our gaze away from the larger issues of geostrategic. The centrality, criticality of JNK in the two-front challenge needs to be underlined. It must never be forgotten. Both in responding to developments along our northern borders, as I said, as, or, as also in tackling the lengthening shadows, new strategic alignments that we see developing along our western horizons. Park, Taliban, China, and all of that. It is extremely important, especially for the military officers, to periodically take our gaze away from the LAC and LC into regions beyond, to look at those threats and to try and see, anticipate how they will manifest in times to come along our borders. GNK, my, in my view, is a strong and evergreen factor in the sino Park military calculus. We all know of the present, but just let me give you some historical pointers to reinforce my point. As far back as in 1962, history tells us, President Ayub suggested to the U.S. Embassy in Karachi with some hubris that park neutrality, which actually meant no military intervention in that war, could be ensured by Indian concessions in Kashmir. So the 62 conflict, you saw this the sino Park collusion emerging. Of course, the cessation of territory by Pakistan to China in 1963 was nothing but a sly attempt to make China party to the JNK dispute. It laid the basis for sino Park collusivity, which we are now seeing grow and manifest in many forms. We see it in Ladakh. It also laid the groundwork for future infrastructure collaboration, CPEC and other manifestations, which, as all military minds know, have grave strategic military implications. The 1965 conflict, interestingly, was caused, driven amongst other factors, by initiatives in India to align the constitutional authority of the JNK state with federal constitutional provisions, extending Articles 356 and 357 to the Jammu and Kashmir state then, and making the prime ministerial position of the political head, the head of government in the state, chief ministerial, etc., etc. So the moot point that I make is this. In JNK, everything that we do internally has an external dimension. And much that happens externally has internal ramifications. So soldiers and officers in JNK, there's also the many directorates and think tanks in India which look at JNK need to keep an ever watchful eye, of course, on the internal moorings. All that the GOC 15 core said, 
context are extremely re relevant, but also keep a very watchful eye on the dynamic externalities. Infirmities in either dimension will have grave consequences for the Indian state, in my view. Point number two, Kashmir's connect with the rest of India, and this, this transcends point number one, uh, Kashmir's connect with the rest of India, in my view, is far more, far deeper than merely one of geography and geostrategics. It is organic, as I said, cultural, historical, civilizational, running back into thousands of years, as recounted to us by history, books like the Raj Tarangini, and even lore, uh, scriptures like the Neelamath Quran. These deep linkages are reinforced by this interesting tale from the days of Mahabharata. So we all know that Mahabharata was a dharma yud. It was a war not for territory or riches, but for moral virtues. So I am told in that war, armies across India took part, but not the army from Kashmir. And why there is a very interesting tale? Because we are told Kashmir then was ruled by a juvenile king. Because he was a juvenile king, underage, he would lack the wisdom, the vivek, the sense of discrimination to make a decision whether to take part in that dharma yud, the moral war, or which side to take part. I am told in Mahabharata, the Kauravs and the Pandavas invited kings from across the country and asked them to make that decision. Now, since the Kashmir king was a juvenile king, he was not invited because he did not have the vivek or the sense of discrimination to do so. So this mere invitation and the consequential decision point to the fact that Kashmir had an intimate connect with the larger goings on, goings on in India then with the matters of historical and strategic import. They were linked deeply with questions of war and peace in wider India. So this suggests a very deep organic connect. In many ways, and this is all equally interesting, Kashmir is the fountainhead of our history and culture. It is the abode of Sanskrit writings and literature, as Dr. Suryakant Bali tells us. Many of the best Sanskrit scriptures have been written in Kashmir, and they have been written by Kashmiris. The uh, Panini's Ashtadhyay, I have not read it, but I am told that it is one of the best books on grammar in terms of logic, syntax, structure, written anywhere in the world. And Panini was a Kashmiri. So Kashmiris, Kashmir, as uh, uh, men of learning tell us, was not only an abode for Parvati, but also Saraswati, origin of, of our knowledge traditions. And these knowledge and traditions, they grew and they evolved on the hills and slopes of Kashmiri's mountain ranges, where our rishis did much of their chintan, mantan, manan and tapas. So on these slopes, lore tells us, the Indian knowledge tradition was nursed. It evolved in group, in a tradition of give and take. So Kashmir gave knowledge and took scholars in return. So the uh, Bharat Muni is not Tishast. So the ordinary man will think it's, it's just about dance, but not Shast was uh, a much wider scripture. In fact, it's equated with the fifth Veda. It is, they say, the ultimate work on performing arts, dance, literature, music, sculpture. It has a deep Kashmiri connect. India's current calling card, yoga, has a Kashmiri connect, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. So, my, the question that I would like to pose is that if the connect is so deep, how can we allow these deep organic connects to be diluted or even weakened? We shall not allow it. We must not allow it. We must, of course, in the same breath, also reinforce and strengthen other traditions of communal harmony and religious syncretism Kashmiriyat, for instance, it has many virtues, but since Kashmiriyat has been spoken of many times in the past, I thought I will labor on these, these, uh, these, these other, uh, what shall I say, traditions of connect with the larger India. Which brings me to my third point, that if such is the depth, width and breadth of Kashmir's organic, cultural, civilizational, historical connect as I recounted, how can the writ of the modern Indian state not run in every nook and corner of Jammu and Kashmir? This was a thing I used to always wonder when I was the GOC at Barabara. So, 
and therefore the salience of the abrogation or neutering of Article 370 on the 5th of August 2019. Now, many superficial discussions about Article 370 sometimes give the impression as if the article was primarily about real estate, the selling and buying of land and rights there too, the inability of non-Kashmiris to buy land. That is of course an important point, but it does not bring out the essence of the problems with Article 370. In my view, that may not be the principal issue. I'm in Shimla today, non Himachalis cannot buy land in Himachal, at least not easily. So that is not the central point. What Article 370 did was that it did not allow the writ of the Indian Parliament to run through Jammu and Kashmir. This, in my view, alienated a territory. It kind of orphanized Jammu and Kashmir. And the weakened writ of the Indian state also had some very grim grassroots consequences. So in Baramula, when I was GOC, I recall, the writ of the state did not quite extend across the river Jhelum northwards into old Baramula. At least till I was there, there was no police chowki, a police station, which is the ultimate and the most obvious grassroots symbol of state authority. So the weakening of the center's writ, this is how it manifested in Baramula. And a police shoki was not established through my tenure in that part of the town. A weakened writ. So now the inability of the center to enforce laws, to enforce contracts, meant that a bridge to facilitate the bypassing of the town by army convoys during peak hour traffic lay abandoned for years. That bridge could not be built for 8 to 10 years, causing untold misery to the ordinary citizen, office goers, school children. And we saw this on a day-to-day -day basis. There were other consequences, and we all know it. Since the National Emblems Act could not be applied, there were multiple instances of disrespect towards the Rashtriya Gan and the Tiranga. There were distortions in the laws of inheritance. Since the prevention of Corruption Act could not apply. There were complaints of rampant corruption. In aggregation, this gave rise to grievance mongering in politics, which in turn led to separatist politics, pro-Pakistan politics, then anti-India politics, then alignment with extremist elements, the unfurling of ISIS flags and all that we saw in that era. All very un undesirable. So in the undoing of Article 370, a significant distortion in my view has been corrected. A lot of work, I would say, yet needs to be done, but the abrogation of the Act was not only essential, but extremely significant. The penultimate point that I would like to make is about the human rights of Kashmiri citizens. And as I said, citizens across sects, religious faith, communities, status of society, through the economic ladder. Kashmir, without doubt, has been going through a lot of pain for a very, very long time. To reverse the sense of alienation amongst the majority and minority communities alike and try and renew a sense of belongingness to Kashmir and to the Indian state, which is Bharat. Minority alienation, may I say, is as much a matter of concern as majority alienation. Take the case of Kashmiri Pandits, for instance. I didn't know till very recently that till 1819, and there is a historical uh, a link here, till 1819, this is what Sushil Pandit says, Kashmir was emptied of Hindus at least six times. So the painful exodus that we saw in the 90s was the seventh of its kind. It is plainly gruesome. So such was the grimness of tragedy that Kashmiri pundits were given three options. And this is what Kashmiri law says. The three options were jaliv, convert, saliv, run away, or jaliv, simply die. So these tragedies or tragedies of this kind must cease. All these wounds, irrespective of communities, sects and societies need to heal. And finally, in all of this, may I point out, the great importance, and I choose my words carefully, importance, relevance, utility 
and salience of the instrument of force. As I said in my opening remarks, not as a blunt in your face tool, but as a sharp, sophisticated, calibrated instrument, of course, operating under firm and un unambiguous political control. Such an instrument, when operating in sync with other levers of statecraft, can have a great stabilizing effect and can often do wonders. Wisdom demands that we leverage the instrument thoughtfully, mesh it into a whole of government approach. Much of it is being done, but it constantly needs to be rejigged and refined to usher in peace, development, and prosperity in Jammu and Kashmir. If one were to come Kashmir, I would infer that while we in India have leveraged the instrument of force with deftness and a wise constancy, the Americans in Afghanistan, for a host of reasons, were somewhat unsure of the best manner of leveraging the instrument of force. This lack of sure-footedness, even leadership, led to a lack of commitment and resolve, at times lacking manifesting in a lack of stomach for violence, violence, I'm not talking of conjuring violence, but in facing up to it. And at others, the announcement of very silly and unreal, unrealistic deadlines for pulling out. Attempts at unequal deals, sans any commitments from the Taliban. And all this resulted in the fiasco that we saw a couple of months back. So just think. The Indian state, by contrast, has leveraged the instrument of force very well with wisdom, commitment, patience, resolve in adequate numbers. When people talk of numbers, it has been my experience that greater numbers allow for restraint and stability. We have demonstrated a certain staying power in Kashmir, which in hindsight has proved to be very wise. The Indian state has leveraged the many softer attributes of the instrument of force. And this anybody in the valley would know. The army is not only a hard instrument, it has many soft manifestations. By leveraging its many softer attributes, as also its hard surgical proficiencies when required, with equal wisdom and deafness. In Kashmir, we must engage with all shades of opinion, dialogue with all stakeholders, less the proponents and promoters of the factories for terror, irrespective of the brands. Much like how, and if I may just quote this lore from Kashmir once again, I heard of it when I was in Baramula, much like how Maharishi Kashyap, as Kashmiri folklore tells us, dealt with Jalod Bhava, a vicious demon who symbolized terror in those times. Now, Jalod Bhava was born of water, so once he finished with his mischief and his terror activities, he disappeared under water and therefore was difficult to catch and defeat. So Maharishi Kashyap drained the entire water body. So the story goes. The Satisar itself, somewhere in the proximity of Baramula. And if you see in Baramula, you will see a massive man-made cut in the hills from which the Jhelum now flows. So that is where I am told he drained the Satisar. So, as a consequence, Jal, uh, Jalod Bhava could no longer hide. And once he could no longer hide, a meteor, meteorite fell from the sky, sky to crush him to death. Therein also lies a lesson. As I was just saying, we shall negotiate with everybody, engage with everyone, except organisms of terror. Terror will simply be crushed. If we could do that and mesh the instrument of force skillfully into the larger mechanisms of statecraft, there is no reason why, should, why we should not be able to build on some recent initiatives in JNK, abrogation of 370 and all of that, as also plug into other nationwide endeavors, those of digitization, technology infusion, startups, unicorns, the wider story of growth and development in the rest of India to bring peace and prosperity in Jammu and Kashmir. It is not that there will not be challenges on the way, and nobody knows it better than 15 core. But with wisdom and courage, Vivek or Sahas ke saath, I am sure we shall overcome. Thank you and Jai.